now we're moving into lesson number nine. And we're now beginning the third unit, and we're talking about personality. Personality overall is divided in two main areas, classical perspectives and contemporary perspectives on personality. We're doing first, for my part, the classical, and it's up to you to teach, to learn, I'm sorry, about the contemporary perspectives. So in terms of classical perspectives of personality, we're going to emphasize just one thing, the work of quite a famous individual in our field. So it goes like this. Usually, and it's going to happen to those of you that are psychology majors, when people ask you, what is your major, and you said psychology, a lot of people assume the same thing. You can read minds. People right away assume that when you're a psychology major, you have your private office with a big red couch. You're sitting in the back with a note. I don't know where you have facial hair, long glasses, and you ask people, tell me more about that. Talk to me about that dream. When people have that stereotype, it's about this individual who was quite popular in our field, Sigmund Freud. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the work of Sigmund Freud. I'm going to summarize a lot of information into just a couple minutes. So it's up to you to keep it up with the readings, OK? So who was Sigmund Freud? Sigmund Freud was an individual that studied to be a neurologist. The reason he was doing that, he was actually a physician, is because back then there was only one of the few professions that were allowed for use in Europe. We're talking about the late 18, no, the mid 1800s. And through his work in private practice, back then physicians were not as respected as they may be today, and they did not make as much money as they make now. He was barely making enough money to survive. One thing, though, that began to catch the attention of Freud was that medication sometimes was not enough to take on problems that could be solved just by talking. Think about how often physical ailments or physical pain can be relieved when you talk to someone. He began to realize that. Freud, more than anything, was known to be a legendary listener. Think about how difficult it can be at times to find a good listener, right? So through the work of Sigmund Freud, he began to open up the new branch of psychology called psychoanalysis. Back then, psychology wasn't the first steps in the first years of its existence. So psychoanalysis is considered the first major theory that, became, that made the field popular. Psychoanalysis is defined as a form of therapy, and it's also defined as a movement to understand the human mind and human behavior. So in essence, psychoanalysis concerns with the power of the unconscious and the unconscious mind. Overall, the unconscious develops through childhood experiences. And it goes like this. You know, children tend to be, you can say innocent, but also quite open, very, very open. So children tend to speak what is on their mind. Children have no concept yet about what is wrong or what is right. They just express themselves whatever they feel like doing. If a kid feels like running around naked, the kid is going to do that, and nobody's going to tell them anything unless, and they will not realize that until someone tells them that it's not okay to be like that. So we seem to have basic instincts. Kids react on these instincts, but as we grow older, adults or the environment experience tells us that we have to control those instincts. So the work of psychoanalysis talks about how the childhood years determine the kind of person that you are as an adult. You can read about that on the slides, but in essence, you have specific needs through your childhood years, and if those needs are not properly fulfilled, those needs will eventually become into issues of your adulthood years. For example, I'll give you one example. You have the second stage called the anal stage. And Freud talks about how toilet training is considered a major outcome in childhood development. And this is what he meant by that. For a kid, the first sense of accomplishment, of real, real accomplishment, is when you learn to master the toilet. Uh, my guess is that, well, first of all, that you can master the toilet at this point. But my second guess is that, now, um, you did not have a clear memory of how you felt when you accomplished that. Parents are supposed to make their kid feel pride, 
when that happens. Imagine that a kid takes a long time to master that. And when the kid is finally able to use it by themselves, by himself, herself, instead of congratulating the kid, the parents are like, well, it took you long enough. That's not the nicest thing. So what happens? That kid did not have that sense of fulfillment and accomplishment. As that kid grows older, that kid may have now a need to feel successful so you have an individual that may try to overpower others. You may have an individual that tries to make other people feel less. You have an individual that is obsessed with power. And it all comes back to what happened in the first six years of life, you know? That is the essence of, of psychoanalysis. The kind of things that happen in the childhood years determines the person that you are as an adult. So in terms of personality, talk. Freud talks about three main aspects of personality. The id, or I call ID, the ego, and the superego. So the id, or ID, those are the basic drives that we have. For Freud, some of those basic drives are, you know, an instinct of sexuality, sometimes an instinct of aggressiveness. Those are basic, basic instincts. When those instincts are seen in kids. Adults teach them to moderate them, to control them. So adults continuously tell us, tell, I mean, reminds us of how we should behave, how we ought to be. So all of us have an idealized version of ourselves. That, in essence, is the superego, what is supposed to be the perfect side of us. All of us have some you can say intrusive, unique, personal thoughts and fantasies that we don't like to share with others. We all do, we keep them, but we keep them inside. And a lot of us feel the pressure and the expectation of how I have to be. That is the super ego, which is kind of the opposite of your ID. For me, a kind of analogy that tends to work is I'm thinking of a little angel and a little devil on the shoulder. The little devil telling you to take it, take it now, feel it now. That's the it. The one that is telling you, the little angel that is telling you how you have to behave and you have to be, that's your angel. So you have a little devil here with the ID and you have the little angel over here with the super ego. The ego is your mind in the middle trying to balance both. A healthy aspect of Personality and development involves an individual that is able to control both properly. If an individual just follows on the ID, that individual is not healthy. If that individual just follows on the have to be, on the superego, on this idealized version of themselves, that is not healthy either. You have to understand that you have a contrast and a battle right in the middle. That is your ego. And quite often, the problem with the superego is that if we try to follow the perfect side of us continuously, we don't acknowledge that instinctive drives that we have. And they can even resort to mental illness. That is the concept of how the unconscious that comes within us can be so powerful that it can direct human behavior. And simply put, an individual that is not willing to acknowledge that kind of instinctual little devil that you have may occasionally say things they don't mean, which we call a Freudian slip. And a quick story to summarize this, I'm back in school. I remember in one of the classes that I was taking, one of my teachers would take a long time to her lecture, three hours in an evening class. And there were days when if she had to go over three hours, she would do that. And she wouldn't mind if the students had to stay there until late. So it was one of those days, I had the longest day and I'm in class and she's talking and talking and talking. The class is three hours long, it's three and a half hours and she still goes on and goes on and goes on. At this point, I have a really annoying classmate. What makes her annoying is that like, she talks like this, like, and she's like annoying, like, you know what I mean? So it's a three hour and a half, three and a half hours long class and I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I wanna go home. And the teacher keeps talking and talking and talking. So she's like, all right, that's it, unless you have a question. 
guess who raises her hand? So this classmate that I have begins to talk and the most basic question takes 20 more minutes. You can picture in my mind, I had some aggressive thoughts towards my classmates, toward this classmate specifically. I acknowledged that and I was able to control it. But if I didn't acknowledge that and I was trying to pretend like I should never feel bad for that, I should never feel mad about that, who knows what my behavior could lead to after I went out of class. Went out of class and did road rage or got mad at someone, punched my dog, I don't know, you know? Review the information I'm summarizing a lot, so it's a basic of what Freud and psychoanalysis is, and, and keep it, keep it up, all right?